Welcome back to another episode of The Huddle. I'm Pete Hooley and I'm really excited for you to hear this one. It's a chat with a man we've all waited to see back on the floor for the Jack Jumpers, Will Magnate. He's had some big performances already and let's find out what he's been through, the tough times with injuries, his time in New Orleans, he ended up in Perth for a little bit and ultimately, let's just see how he's doing. We're picked first or picked last, like our process every day doesn't change. Yeah. But I think that game definitely launched launched me into that sort of spotlight as to, alright, this kid could play in the NBA. It's definitely a healthy reminder every game that I'm still, you know, a young, young player and have a lot to give and still a lot to learn. All right, Will, thanks for your time, mate. Uh, I've been excited to chat to you because I've called the last couple of games that you've been healthy on the floor. So thanks for jumping on and how are you feeling? Yeah, well, thanks for having me, firstly. Um, but yeah, feeling good. Like I just said to you before, I just had a full body cramp on the massage table, so a bit ginger right now, but uh, other than that, man, all, all good. Uh, we're currently in, in the FIBA break period. There's, there's no FIBA games, uh, unfortunately, but what is the focus for Tassie going into this little break? Because it's been a good start. And I guess what's the focus for yourself? Is your program of conditioning a bit different to the rest of the team in this break? Yeah, so... Um, I guess for us, we're still trying to build our defense. Um, and instead of doing that in more of a broad sense, we've kind of focused that down to two things and trying to focus on that for, for December um, and just have those goals that, that we'll work towards. And yeah, for myself, it's I guess it's a little bit different to what everyone else is doing. Um, the big focus for me has been, and my strength coach has been really good with this, is he said, just because you're back doesn't mean you're back. Um, you still got a lot of work to do. Um, so I still got a lot of work to do with my body and my conditioning and getting right, obviously, because I missed, you know, a big preseason and whatnot. Um, but I mean, you know, they're, they're looking after me and they're, you know, sort of, we're trending in the right direction. Um, and I'm, I'm feeling good. And, um, this next sort of fever break is a good chance to just build some more training load in and, you know, continue to, to try and grow. I am wearing my Tasmania green, by the way. I'm not sure if it's, uh, <laughs> if it's helping you bit, settle in. It's a bit dark, but yeah. <laughs> but uh, everyone's on the Jack Jumpers bandwagon this year, I guess, more so than the first couple of years because everyone was, uh, I guess, picking them to come last in the first season. You shocked the world, essentially. I'm sure you didn't shock any of the people within the locker room who believed in what you guys could achieve. But now it's a little different. Now things are going around there and uh, people are expecting Tasmania to contend. What's the mood like overall? And is, do you block out the noise completely or how hard is it not to get caught up in what's going on outside? Yeah, it, it is an interesting interesting one because it is different this year. The first years it's been, you know, everyone's, oh, they're last, you know, and then it's a surprise again, um, like you said. But sort of even, even in those years, it was who cares? Like who cares what everyone else thinks? Like what we do um, and we care about what we do every day and the process that we build towards. And if we're picked first or picked last, like our process every day doesn't change and our habits stay the same. And that'll take us to where we deserve to go. So that's the belief in our program and, and sort of the culture that Scott's kind of instilled in us to, um, you know, it's it's us against the world, no matter where they're picking us on the ladder. Taking me into when you sign with the Jack Jumpers and living in Tasmania, I mean, you grew up in, in Queensland and you played around the world. What was your first instincts, I guess, signing with the Jack Jumpers? What were you going to expect and has that really delivered to that or has it been different? Tell me a little bit about it all. Yeah, it's interesting. I was, I was actually thinking about that, I guess, when you asked me to come on the podcast, what questions you'd be asking. And I kind of remember it was, um, I was so focused, oh, I want to get back to the NBA. And I thought um, when I spoke to Scott first, it was the easiest decision I made. Like he just, you know, labeled it all out. He said, this is the work we're going to do. This is the program or the, the progress I see you making. And um, I feel like this is a spot for me. And so it was a pretty easy decision to come here and a little bit daunting in the fact that it was a new club. But, um, you know, and then obviously had a few injuries and whatnot. And sort of my mindset's kind of changed a little bit since I first signed here. But um, it's just been an amazing program to be a part of and um, uh, the people and, you know, the state. And it's it's just been awesome. So I'm very happy I signed here. And um, yeah, it's been it's been a pretty cool three years. You've played in front of some, some massive crowds and some passionate fans. I mean, your time at Perth, we talk about crazy fans. The Red Army's up there with one of the best fan bases we can see around any professional sport. But the Jack Jumpers, whatever they're called, the fans, I like to call them the Ant Army because of the way they get up and about. When this whole 
franchise started and, and you're one of those founding players. Did you expect it to be the kind of craze that we see from the fans? I mean, we talked to Jack McVeigh, we talked to Scott Roth walking down the street. Jack McVeigh says he gets stopped uh, at the grocery store and people are chatting about the games. Did you expect any of this and how is it for you? I don't think we really expected the impact. Um, obviously, winning or going as far as we did in year one um, helped a lot of that. But I still remember like the first couple of home games we had, it was full, but the fans were still trying to figure out how to cheer for the game. And like, we kind of grew as a club. Like we, we were two and six or something, not winning. And then the fans started getting into it. We started to roll and, and we kind of grew together. So that was a pretty, pretty special part of that whole first season. But I definitely don't think we expected it to be, um, as big as it, as it has been, but it's been pretty amazing just the impact we've been able to have on kids and, you know, I think it just gives a legitimate pathway now for Tasmanian kids to to strive towards. And um, I mean, the next step is obviously sort of breaking into the women's side of sport and WNBL and having a club, you know, of, of female sort of, um, you know, trajectory for, for young girls to have as well. So um, it's been pretty special and um, hopefully we can keep growing and, um, you know, evolving the sport. What do you do when you're not playing hoops then in Tasmania? What do you like to get up to? Because I think Clint Steinle, your captain, likes to get on the golf course. You joining him on the links. What do you do to kind of refresh yourself away from the game? Yeah, um, I'm a pretty relaxed person. I don't do too much. Um, I'm, I'm down by the water, so I like to get in the water, even though it's 11 degrees. Uh, it's a good little refresher for you. But um, I play a little bit of golf, get out on a walk a little bit, um, a few beaches around and just honestly, I like to just get out and sort of have go to some cafes, try some new food, just get get out of the house. So, um, like I just said, I had a cramp on the table, so I'm usually pretty sore after practice. I'm not out trying to do too much physically. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful city. Um, lots of really good food and good people. So everywhere you go, there's interesting conversations and trying something new and, and you know meeting someone that you wouldn't have thought you'd met. Is, is your coach, Scott Roth, basically the mayor of Tassie? Because uh, people like to say that they stopped him at Sydney Airport. I'm just imagining him down at Salamanca Markets, everybody hanging off him, wanting to get a picture with a great man. Yeah, well, I mean, the whole team shows up somewhere and all the kids run to him first for an autograph. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it just it speaks to what he's done for the, for the state and the passion he has. And um, it's been, you know, it's funny at moments just watching him gallivant around the stadium, but obviously everyone eats it up and... Um, you know, it just shows, like I said, his passion for it and, and, and his love for the game. What's your relationship like with him? Because you mentioned a bit about the recruitment and I guess the pitch that he wanted to bring you and get you involved in the Jack Jumpers program. And what kind of coach do you think is his style what really helps you succeed? Because you would have had a bunch of different coaches and we'll get into your journey so far. And I guess tell me a little bit about you and Scott Roth. Yeah, so we definitely have an interesting relationship. Um, we kind of both hold each other accountable and that's kind of what he said to me when he said, you know, like, oh, if there's something wrong with the club, what do you think? Like, I want I want you to say it because I kind of have a bit of that demeanor about myself where I will speak my mind and he's always encouraged me to do that. So he, he encourages me to stand up, try and be a leader, um, you know, but he'll also hold me to the same standards as everyone else. So uh, we, have, we have a good relationship and, I mean, I, I really enjoy his coaching style, I think, He's a coach um, that no matter sort of where we are in the ladder, what's happening, like his process is the same. So that first, speaking to that first year when we were two and six, like we weren't doing anything different at practice all of a sudden. There was no, all right, we need to just drastically change everything. Like he, he believes in what he believes in and instills that in you as a player. And it's like, all right, well, we're sticking this out with you then. And um, he does a great job of getting you to buy into the program and the culture and the club and, um, and, you know, it's no matter who you are, you're being held accountable. You know, he'll hold Milton the same as a development player, and um, which I really respect about him and, and which, what I really love about this uh, program. You mentioned just before about things you like to do off the floor, whether it's getting the water, cafes. I'm interested in, I guess, the mental refreshing side for you who's battled these injuries the last couple of years. I mean, we're going to touch a little bit about your time in the States, and we know you went to Perth after starting off in, in Brisbane. What's it been like mentally? Has it been something that you've had to get some help from, whether Scott Ross, some other people? Have you found it, I guess, harder to deal with at times compared to others? Obviously, you know, everyone everyone gets injured and there's injuries in sport and, you know, it's it's something I've sort of battled through my career and 
I think with my knee last year, yeah, I really struggled because there was no sort of answer. And it was like, why is it sore? And it was kind of, you know, everyone's like, oh, this is a 50-50. We'll try this. We'll try that. And like that that side of things really, really I really struggled with because it wasn't, you know, all right, if we do this program and rehab, like we'll get you back to, to playing. So I found that really tough. But um, I guess what I've really sort of come to realize is the, the people around you make a big part of how you're going to feel and, and how you're going to approach your rehab. And, um, I mean, like being around Jack, who's, you know, positive all the time, always optimistic, always asking you how you're doing, you know, fab, you know, it just it's all the players that kind of help you get through it. And you still have, you know, shit days and, you know, you rock up to train. I don't want to sit there and watch training and ride the bike. Like, you know, everyone comes over and calls you Lance Armstrong. It's like, yeah, mate, like it's starting to wear me down a bit. Yeah, it's not, not as funny as, as it was four months ago. So, um, but you know, just the help I've had, I've, I've, you know, seen therapists off court as well, just to help me get through it. And a big part of that was, you know, sort of finding myself outside of basketball as well. Like go do other stuff. Don't, you know, your whole life isn't, isn't basketball. So just reaching out to friends and staying involved and trying to distract my mind otherwise when I'm off the court. But, um, it's more, I've, I've found just being around good people all the time really just keeps you on track and, you know, it's not a team where everyone wants to go out drinking all the time. And so it's not like there's people trying to pull you aside and, and do bad stuff. Everyone's trying to keep you on track and everyone wants you to succeed here and celebrate that with you. So I'm in a very fortunate spot. I'm very grateful for, you know, not only the players, but the coaching staff and the medical staff here for sticking with me and, and keeping faith. And because I know it's easy to just say, oh, this dude's just injury prone. So, but, you know, they stuck with me and, um, you know, have kept me on the right track and have really helped me through, you know, tough days and, and have really rode the, the highs with my with my good days as well. I find that really interesting to hear you say that, that finding that balance over the last couple of years when, when you've been injuries because everyone thinks professional basketballers, professional sportsmen, sportswomen as well, okay, they live and breathe their sport. That's all they do. They're going to be putting in countless hours. And I get the sense that maybe that last year in Brisbane when you're about to get the NBA taste that, Basketball was what you wanted to make a career out of and that you maybe didn't have the balance you have now. Is that the silver lining of the last few years of injuries of understanding, okay, I'm doing this when I'm practicing, but when I'm away from the court, I now know how to enjoy myself and how to be fresh for when I do pick a ball up? I think so. I think, obviously, I'm from Brisbane, so I sort of had that, you know, I'd grown up there my whole life. I had all my friends, my family. I was living at home, so I had that kind of separation anyway. And, you know, my family... Although they support me fully, they're not a massive basketball family. So coming home, it was never like, oh, how was training? How'd you shoot it? It was just, hey, feeling, you know, so I had that separation in Brisbane anyway. So I think it was when I started moving overseas and different clubs and, you know, I was a bit sporadic there for a while, but um, you start to just, yeah, try and find that separation from, yes, I love my sport and I love my job, and but it's not who I am. And if, if you tie yourself into that all the time, that, that this basketball is who I am, and that's when injuries really set you back because you're like, oh, I have no purpose. I have no sort of um, your drive anymore to go do anything because I can't do what I love to do. So just trying to find other stuff to, to keep refreshed and, you know, enjoy enjoy the time and be grateful for, for the learnings and opportunities and everything like that. What exactly was that knee injury? Is there a specific, I guess, um, coin term for it? Because you're right, it wasn't like a fracture. It wasn't something you're like, okay, you're out six to eight weeks and you'll come back. And if it wasn't the same as what Nathan Sobey was going through, it was very similar where the rest was all you could really do. Run us through exactly how it all came about. Yeah, so I, I had, we, put, we started winning some games and I pulled up after a Sydney game and thought like, oh, my knee's a bit sore. And it kind of felt like I had a corky but like right on my sort of next to my kneecap. And then I, I was, I brought it up and it, it settled down the next day. And then we played United the day after. And after that game, I just couldn't walk. Uh, it was pretty, pretty sore. So it turned out I had, uh, cause I've had a bit of cartilage stuff around uh, in, in the past. And um, it was, I had bone swelling in, in there, which as soon as you said that, I was like, shit, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I had a, a little cartilage nick up as well. And I think it was just kind of the angle. So like whenever my knee got into flexion, it would, um, it would grab and rub and it was just, 
Uh, it was brutal. So I was kind of getting to the point where I'd sat for a, a little bit. They scanned it again, and it was just something else seemed to be going wrong every time. So it kind of got it got to the point eventually where they uh, had a few injections, and they really helped. They really helped settle it down and um, helped me rebuild my strength and my knee to control it, so it doesn't externally rotate as much and i mean we can go into the science of it all if you want but um you know so like i said i've just had i've had great help around me and willingness to try new things to reach out to other doctors and you know not feel like they know everything here and um they really tried to, to help get me back right so I want, I want to take your mind back to, uh, I was calling this game back in Brisbane when you were wearing a Bullets uniform, and I can't remember how many threes you hit, but you're playing against Andrew Bogut for the Kings, and you're knocking him down for outside, you had a big game, and it, it seemed like you were already on the map, but that was where Homicide came up with the two-way magne and get this man to the States. What do you remember, firstly, of that game, if at all, but just that last period before you jetted off to America, because it seemed like from that game, basically, it was a whirlwind 12 months for you. Yeah, it was, um, I think I, it was the first game I started. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know why or, uh, you know, I forget, I kind of forget all the, the details of to why, but uh, Lamanus said to me, um, you have to shoot the ball. If if we're going to start you at the four, you have to shoot the ball. And he said, I do not care if it goes in or not, but you have to shoot it. So that, that gives you a fair bit of confidence as a player, when the head coach is saying, if you shoot it, I'm not going to take you off. I don't care if it goes in or not. So, um, and then something I was reminiscing with my agent about too is that that season, like I wasn't, I was playing very, I was playing well and I was having moments and stuff, but I kind of had about four weeks where I played really well. It was just after that game, I went on a little stretch and that kind of took me to, to the jump and then COVID. And it was, like you said, a whirlwind, a whirlwind year. And, um, you know, got my opportunity to, to head over to the States and see what it was like. And yeah, I mean, it was all, I'm very appreciative for it all, but, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely that, that, I think that game definitely launched, launched me into that sort of spotlight as to, all right, this kid could play in the NBA. You're a few years removed from that now, and obviously you've probably grown as a player, as a person, and definitely matured as a basketball player. Do you think, had you known what you know about yourself now, but also, I guess, uh, being a professional, do you think you would have been better prepared in that couple of months stretch before heading overseas? Because I'm sure back then, and still just a kid, that it would have hit you pretty fast. Oh, I'm going over to potentially live out my dream here, and like this is a whole lot to take in after just having a pretty successful little period with Brisbane. Yeah, I mean, obviously, as, as you mature, you learn a lot. Um... But I mean, I have matured from those experiences, so it's kind of hard to say like, yeah, I'd be a better person for it. But um, I think the hard part was it was all unknown. And as everything was during that COVID year, like what, what's happening? Like, am I allowed to go? Because I, I was just about to head off. I booked all my, my workouts with all the teams and uh, they just got booked, got all the flight confirmations and then the international borders shut down. And then NBA is cancelled. It's like, all right, well, what's happening? And Because I'm not in it, it's like, Oh, we, we don't know either. Like, you know, a team's still excited to sign me, and yeah, so it was it was interesting. And I mean, hindsight's a beautiful thing. I wish I was more mature, and um, you know, could have you know maybe worked harder here or there. Or, but you know, I'm, I'm grateful for my opportunity, the opportunities that I've had, and the experiences I've had as well. Tell us a little bit of some of those good and perhaps not so good experiences over there, because uh, I'm doing a little bit of. Looking back, there's some pictures of you on the bench. You're wearing the, the mask that everyone was wearing for so long. And we had our own issues here that we had to deal with. What was it like for you over there? Because on one hand, you're right. You're like, this is, I'm wearing a New Orleans Pelicans jersey. Like, this is something I've always wanted to achieve. And then the flip side of it is, this is not a real world we're living in right now with the times that are going on. Yeah, so it was, um, and I kind of got there and people were pretty much saying straight away, oh, this isn't what the NBA is really like. Um, so it was... I had two COVID tests a day, so I had to get into the facility, get back. It was—I remember it being a massive fine if I was doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing. Maybe it's like fifty grand if I was doing so, and you forfeit all the pay that you miss for your two weeks. So it was kind of one of those things. Like I was so young and like immature, not immature, but I was just nervous to. I didn't want to upset anyone and, and get COVID or give Zion Williamson COVID. You know what I mean? So I was, I was pretty. I was a bit of a, a homebody. I was just back and forth from the apartment to the arena, and 
um, you know, trying to make the most of my experiences and um, still had some, some good moments. And we had a little international crew. It was me, Stephen Adams and, you know, Billy Hernan Gomez and a few others who would all go out to dinner on the road together. And so I still got, you know, some, some cool experiences in there, but um, it was definitely unique and, um, and obviously not playing is a bit of a challenge as well, but uh, yeah, it was, it was one of those things I was, you got to earn your way. And that was a big teaching moment for me, like just cause I'd had a, a pretty good year in the NBL. It that means absolutely nothing until you got to earn your minutes and earn your spot and everything like that. There's, there'd be some, I guess, perfect places that people would want to land in the NBA, whether that's the Lakers, whether that's New York. But for me, as someone who's been to New Orleans, it's a, it's a beautiful place. It's a lot of fun. How much would you have liked to enjoy, I guess, what the, the whole place had to offer outside of COVID times? Yeah, it, it is a cool city. It's, it's the least American city in America which I think I, I really enjoyed about it. It has a little bit of culture on the side and, you know, the music and the food. And um, I, I would have really liked to enjoy a lot of it, you know, but um, it's one of those things at the end of that, I'm there to do a job and, you know, my job is to, you know, stay healthy and stay fit, don't get sick. And, um, you know, obviously would love to enjoy it all, but yeah, yeah got to do my job. What was the difference, I guess, than going to New Orleans? Because you went to college for a year in Tulsa. Tulsa's uh, a little bit different to New Orleans. I'm not sure. Is there actually similarities maybe between Tulsa and Tassie at all? Or how was your time in college? Yeah, college was, I mean, college is always fun, as you know. Um, you learn it's, there's parties and distractions and everything. And um, uh, I didn't love the, the coaching in college. I remember... I was playing quite well and starting and then my parents flew out and I didn't play any minutes while my parents were there. <laughs> and then they left and then I started again. And I was like, all right, mate, what are we doing here? Like, and it was just stuff like that that I didn't love about college, but it definitely taught me I'm not as I'm not the best athlete out there. Like you're running around, everyone's, everyone's just as quick, everyone's stronger, everyone's faster. Um, so I learned to play, I guess, at that speed and that pace. Um, but, you know, still back my ability to block shots and um, and roll and, you know, catch lobs. So I learned a lot. But when that opportunity at Brisbane came came up to, to, re -sign, or to sign on for three years, I kind of jumped at it pretty quickly. You came back from the Pelicans. Tell me a little bit about obviously getting the phone call uh, that it wasn't going to work out at that time. And, and then you went across to Perth. And I mentioned it being a whirlwind. I wasn't just talking about getting to New Orleans because even arriving at the Wildcats and everybody was like, oh my God, Will Magne's back. And it, it felt like, I guess, jumping into a team midway through, it's easier said than done, but it also seemed like a bit of a, a challenge, I guess, mentally trying to do that from everything that happened in the last 12 months. Yeah, so um, I remember we were, we were playing in Brooklyn and we were down 30 at halftime. And I was thinking, all right, like, I might get some burn here. So stayed warm, down 40, down 45, didn't even get looked at. So I remember I called my agent. I was like, is something wrong? Like, am I doing something wrong? And he, he kind of, he's like, oh, I'll find out. Um, and then, yeah, the next day, uh, David Griffin's like, oh, can you see me in my office? And it was kind of, it was, it was unusual because he said, I, we, we've loved you. You know, you do all the right things. Um, you're just not what the coach is looking for at this time. And, you know, he wants someone with a bit more experience that he can throw out there. And so, you know, it wasn't, wasn't anything, you know, I was doing too wrong. And, um, yeah. And then it was kind of what I want to do. Do I want to keep playing or do I want to, um, you know, stay over here for a couple more months and try summer league? And so I made the call to come back to Perth. The two weeks quarantine was brutal and then came out of that and I played six games in 11 days because they had catch up games and I, I didn't even have a practice. It was, it was flat out. So, you know, trying to learn how to play with Bryce and John, trying to figure out defense, trying to learn the flex, you know, with dudes who have been playing it for, for so long. And, um, it, it definitely was a whirlwind and it, it was flat out. I think mentally I was, I was okay. I was trying to do the right things to help win. And, um, you know, obviously Bryce went down and, yeah, you know, the load kind of got thrown onto me a little bit to to play sort of outside my role. Like, all right, we need you to post up more. We need you to do this, which, you know, I don't think I'm a bad post player, but I'm definitely more of a, a pick and roll guy and, and a lob threat um, down that end. So, um, we, I mean, we still made the final and we played our asses off and unfortunately couldn't get it done. But, 
yeah, it was it was a flat out couple of months. It was, you know, so all of a sudden, America into a hotel for two weeks, played six games in eleven days. Bodies aching, feet are sore. It was just, it was crazy. It's funny that you mentioned uh, not potentially being a post up guy, a pick and roll guy, but you seem like a guy that, whether it's dunking, whether it's blocking, doing all that, that the fun side of the hoops when you're out there that you're at another level. And we saw that the other night, that big block you had on Mango Mathiang, and you had a few words to say. Now, I would have loved to have you mic'd up during that moment, but how much do you enjoy, I guess, that... You, I'm all for letting emotion happen. If you make a big play like that, I want to see that more. Uh, how much does it give you the joy on a defensive stop rather than an oop, I guess, to, to let everything out? Yeah, well, I think... Um, well, I think with, like, alley oops is like, yeah, they're, they're cool, but, like, Milton does all the work and just puts it next to the hoop for me. Like, I just, I, I don't really do much, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm just a target, but I, I can put it in. But I've always kind of, um, you know, backed myself on the defensive end. And, yeah, I mean, I, I love blocking shots and, and stuff like that. But, yeah, it does fire me up. And I kind of blacked out. I don't really remember what I said either. <laughs> but the worst part was, like, I look up and Sean's throwing the ball away. So I was like, oh, Sean, like, now I'm going to play defense again. Like, oh, but, you know, it is fun and... At the moment, you know, I'm just grateful to be out there running around um, and, you know, being able to play at a high level and um, just just enjoying as many moments as I can. So when I'm fired up like that, I'm definitely enjoying myself. I love that you said that you're grateful to be out there because we can see that. And again, that incredible stat line was in just 16 minutes. Do you feel like when you're warming up and, and Scott Roth said how the conditioning at the time is probably what all you could do, but do you feel... Like mentally, like oh, I'm ready to go. I could play 30 if you want. And then once you're running up and down, you're like, okay, my body's just not quite there yet, and you've got to snap back into here's my little short spurts until I get that game conditioning. Yeah, it, it's interesting because I've always been a give me four minutes and I'll play as hard as I can, and I'm going to be cooked. Like that's it's kind of how I've always played played the game, and I don't I'm not out there trying to conserve energy, and um, and it's how Scott likes likes me to play as well. You know, when you're cooked, you put your hand up, and he puts the next guy in, and you just trust him to do the job. So, um, I mean, I'll, I'll play as hard as I can for every minute I'm out there. If it's 12 minutes or 20 minutes or if I can play 30, then, then it's 30. But, um, you know, that's, like I said, I've still got a long way to go and a lot of work to do with my body and my conditioning. You are, you're a great character of the league for those who actually get to know you and not just see you yelling at players after blocking. But I need you to explain something for me. Your Instagram bio is, should we put some tables together? Well, what's that all about? <laughs> well, it's, it was just a joke with my mates. Uh, like whenever you'd see someone at, at a nightclub or something, you'd just be like, oh, should we just put some tables together? Um, and it just became like an inside joke when we were growing up and then... I didn't know what else to put there, so I just chucked that in. And then yeah, the little YouTube links, one of my best mates singing Fireflies when he's 10 years old, and he can't, uh, he can't take it down. So I've just, I've just put it up there to share. And I think when I got, when I made the NBA, everyone thought of like my highlight tape um, <laughs> that was coming on my page. So uh, they clicked on that. He got maybe another six or seven thousand views on it. So that was, that was quite funny. So you're basically rickrolling all the the Pelicans fans with your own version. I like that. I'm here for that. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Well, I've never been one to, you know, just throw my highlights out there and make me a tape player. I just, I just play basketball and, um, you know, I just, yeah, love my friends and want to want them to not feel like they're, you know, too far out of my life, like I'm too good for them or anything like that. So, mate, way to keep them involved in, in my in my circle. Speaking of some of those friends, you, you got to play uh, for Australian the, the junior teams with a couple, and there's a photo of a. Uh, your old teammate Matt Kenyon there, and also Tom Fullerton, who from Brisbane and now playing yeah. uh, in the AFL, just moved to Melbourne actually in a yeah. trade. What's it like, I guess, going through this professional life? And obviously, he switched codes with, with these guys that you, you've grown up with and, and played with. Yeah, it's cool. Um, you know, I actually had a moment in, against Cairns when me and Lat Man were boxing each other out. And I mean, he was in the room next to me in the AIS. So I actually said to him, I was like, oh man, just like we're back at the shoot. And like we both had a little giggle about it, but um, it, it's cool and it's it's awesome because you, you you kind of think back as to how hard people used to work. And you know, I was with DJ and Jack White and Sam Froling, Harry Froling, like all you know, everyone. So um, it, it's definitely cool. And then when someone does like you know Tom Wilson, Tom Fullerton does the code switch and um, pursues their other dreams, and you know you you kind of get to be a part of their story and. Um, you know, me and Fuller are still mates, me and Tom Wilson are still mates. So 
um, it is pretty cool and it's just friendships you develop for a long time and, you know, you, you see, you know, Jason Kiddy is a good friend of mine but he's still mates with all his mates from the AIS and, you know, it's, it's definitely something that helps you build long-term relationships. The co-switch for Tom Wilson and Tom Fultz in his AFL. Now, I, I saw, I don't know where it was, it might have been somewhere on Google, picture of you running around rugby, obviously, growing up in Queensland. <laughs> Have you? When's the last time that I guess you played? Whether it was a, a kind of social game or whatever, and what kind of rugby player were you? Yeah, I was big and goofy, um, but I was I was pretty decent. I could move all right. Um, but the last game of rugby I played was on my 14th birthday. Um, I ran at a, a a big Samoan, and he picked me up and dropped me on my head and shattered my <laughs> collarbone. Um, and I said to Dad, I was like, "Yeah, look, I'm liking basketball. I think like this. I don't think this is for me anymore." So. Um, that was the last game I ever played, but you know it was always it was always interesting because we're not a basketball family, and I was the first to kind of stray away from rugby. And my brother had had so much success already playing rugby, and um, it was it was kind of cool because it separated us, and I think we both started to appreciate the journey that we we're on um, on our own, but also at the same time we could train together in off season, do some funny stuff, and you know I'll kick the footy to him, and he'll you know come and rebound for me. So. Um, it definitely helped, you know, grow my brother and I's relationship too. We, we appreciate your time, Will. We love seeing you on the floor. But I have to ask you one more thing because you have been around, I guess, Australian circles for a while now. We, we do remember you running around at Brisbane and everything that's happened. But do you take a moment to realise how young you still are and how long you could potentially have left in your career? Because in my mind, since I've, I've played against you, since I'm commentating, I'm like, okay, Will Magnay's back. This is great to see 29-year-old, 30-year-old Will Magnay. But that's just not the case. Do you have to remind yourself that you've still got yeah. plenty left? Yeah, sometimes. I, uh, well, we do a half-court shot every every uh, pre-game for, for 50 bucks or whatever, whatever it is. And it goes in age order and I shoot third. <laughs> it's like, damn. <laughs> I look around, Drimmick's shooting at the back. I'm like, oh, man, sometimes I feel as old as him, but it's definitely a healthy reminder every game that I'm still, you know, a young young player and have a lot to give and still a lot to learn. So, um, yeah, it's pretty funny. Mate, we appreciate it. Uh, thanks for stopping by, and we love seeing you on the floor. Good luck personally for the rest of the season, but obviously for the jack jump. I think one thing yeah. all NBL fans have realised, if you're not a fan, if they're not your main team, the jack jumps, I think they're everyone's second favourite team until you play them. So uh, good luck for it all, and yeah. uh, we can't wait to see you continue to do your thing. Awesome. Thanks, Pete.